Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil our remain. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope that wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives for you, our joy and prize. To see the captive hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are the church. to see everybody here. Um, I wasn't really sure if I would be here because I was uh, sick this, this week. The plague entered my house about Tuesday. Uh, I, would, I believe probably it was my youngest, sweetest, cutest child, Haley, who was the culprit, uh, but we can't be sure. But if you'd like assuredness of disease, you are welcome to my home. Um, 
My parents just dropped off a lunch for literally a few minutes, and the next day they both had fevers. Uh, and my mother-in-law came to our house to help, but once she heard that story, she left very quickly. Uh, I would call her a coward, but she is my mother-in-law, and God has restricted such comments from the wise. So on to better things. Last week, uh, Jen taught us that Christianity isn't supposed to be status quo, that it's not supposed to be boring. Uh, that Jesus' teachings were radical, they were challenging, they created a life of adventure. And uh, she ended last week by, by quoting from the Sermon on the Mount. She quoted this, she said, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We are called to something greater, to be something better, to show the works of our Father. And this week, we'll be looking at the end of that Sermon on the Mount, the very last statement that Jesus says, the way He concludes this amazing sermon with this final statement. Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This is the conclusion to what is the greatest sermon ever written, the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon was a sermon to end all sermons. Often people who don't even believe in Christianity can point to this sermon as one of the greatest teachings in history. But it's not an easy sermon though sometimes we report it this way. Jesus calls us to a higher standard than even the law given to Moses, where it's no longer an eye for an eye, but should your enemy strike you, you're to turn the other cheek to them as well. You don't just love those who love you, but you love your enemies. You don't look on someone in lust. You don't be angry with a brother or sister. You don't practice righteousness to be seen. You don't store treasures up on this earth, but treasures in heaven. Be perfect as your Father is in heaven. It's a very high calling that Jesus is preaching. And He ends it with this Scripture. This choice before us today. Everyone who hears these words of Mine and acts on them is like a wise man. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act is like a foolish man. One builds his house on rock and one on sand. And we are not surprised to find out that the house built on sand is the one that comes crashing down. It's an amazing sometimes how you can read the same passage in Scripture so many times And I've even preached on this scripture before, and I find something that I never, ever saw clearly. I'd always sum this up by saying we need to make Christ our foundation, and we will be on solid ground. And that that is exactly what this is about. But what I never noticed is what the difference is between the wise and the foolish builders. What they did to build their house on such different grounds. Both of these men hear the words of Jesus. That's what Jesus says. But only one puts the words into practice. Whereas the NASB translated, only one acts while the other does not. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them is like a wise man. Whereas everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them is like a foolish man. Both listen to the words of Jesus. This is not about somebody who hears Jesus' words and somebody who doesn't hear Jesus' words. 
but it's about a person who acts on what Jesus says, and then one who just listens. It's a choice, a choice to put his teachings into practice. And in the Christian faith, when we hear act or do or works, we often think about works righteousness, where we're trying to work our way into God's grace, earn our salvation. If I just did enough, then maybe God will accept me. But we know that we're not saved like that. We're saved by faith through Christ. That is the heritage that we have from Paul, from Luther. Sole fide, by faith alone. Because it is not by our works that we are saved, but by God. And it is freely given. But this does not mean that we are not called to act according to the Scriptures. That we are not to be a people of goodness. In fact, Christ says in that same sermon, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same is to call least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We are called to be doers of the word and not simple listeners. And that's part of our difficulty. You know, when I go to a sermon or I sit down and I'm talking to somebody about God or I read, read the Bible or I read a book about religion, I walk away having really gotten something, having really listened, and I understand the right way to act. And then I go off, and I often don't change a thing. I become a listener, but I don't act. I don't put into practice what I have heard. I can get this insight into who I am, what I need to change, and then I don't do it. And that's not the way of God. We are not merely to be listeners, but doers. It's said that one of uh, President Reagan's favorite stories was the one about the minister's son uh, who was taken out camping one day. His companion had warned him not to stray too far from the campfire because the woods uh, were full of wild beasts of all kinds. The young boy had every intention of, of following this advice. He listened to him, doing what he heard. But inevitably, he was drawn away by curiosity and wandered farther and farther from the fire. Suddenly, he found himself face to face with this very large and powerful looking bear. And he saw no means of escape. And seeing the bear advance rather menacingly towards him, the minister's son did what he had been taught to do. He knelt down and he prayed for deliverance. He closed his eyes tightly, but opened them a few moments later and was delighted to see that the bear was also kneeling in prayer in front of him. And he said, oh bear, isn't it wonderful? Here we are with such different viewpoints and such different lives and such different perceptions of life, and we are both praying to the same Lord. And the bear said evenly, son, I don't know about you, but I'm saying grace. We can hear the words that keep us from danger. We can listen, but if we don't act accordingly, the world will eat us alive. To be a wise man who builds his house on a firm foundation, we must act. But in order to act, the Bible also tells us that we have to see ourselves for who we are. In the book of James, it says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed and what they do. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. If we listen and we don't do what it says, we're like someone who looks in the mirror and we see ourselves. And when we walk away, we immediately forget what we look like. But this mirror doesn't reflect our, our physical appearance, but our souls, who we really are. Because we are much more than our flesh. 
If we look in this mirror, which is righteousness, which is sacredness, which is the teachings of Christ, the moral truth that God has given us, and we do not act on what we see, of what use is the mirror to us? What use is the Word of God if we do not seek to do what it says? And this is not about some formula. It's not about providing us the exact right way of doing things. This is the reality of who God is, of being in a relationship with God, because God is our mirror. God's Word is our mirror, and we can deny our reflection. We can forget what it looks like as soon as we we see it, it, but it's to our grief, to our own destruction that we walk away having been just listeners. Because how can we accept God if we deny the truth that His presence brings to us? We can't be in a relationship with God if God cannot grow close to us in truth. On the night I became a Christian, um, I experienced the presence of God. And His presence hurt me. There was no need for God to tell me who I was. As God grew close, all illusions that I had created were thrown out the window. And doesn't that make sense? If God's very being is truth and goodness, how could the lies I had told myself continue in His presence? But with that presence brought the realization of who I really was. And that was painful. It was unbelievably painful. But I could no longer deny what I had become. And the mirror had grown close to me, so close, and I could not stand the image that I saw. And I could either deny the image and continue in my illusion, or I could see the truth of it and act according to what I saw. The picture of Dorian Gray, um, I don't know if many of you, I'm sure, have read that, is uh, by Oscar Wilde. And he tells the story of Dorian Gray, who is this beautiful man, the most beautiful man in the world, that this artist feels that his his greatest masterpiece was the portrait of Dorian. Uh, And he, he gives this portrait to Dorian. And Oscar Wilde writes that it was Dorian's youth that was beautiful, his innocence, his physical beauty. And on a whim, Dorian decides to, on on to try and keep that beauty, he makes a prayer that he'll never grow older and that all of his sins might be cast upon the portrait that the artist painted. And so his prayer is answered and he goes through life with his youth intact, committing sin after sin, yet he looks like the same innocent person, but the portrait, the portrait shows the marks of the demented soul. When he's cruel, He sees a line of cruelty on the portrait. When he deceives people, he sees markings of a a liar, of a deceiver. And when he kills a man in cold blood, he sees blood on the hands of the portrait. But not a single change to his face. He's still innocent. And so he feels free to commit sin after sin because the consequence is on his portrait until he cannot stand seeing this terrible image of this person in this portrait anymore, and he grabs a knife and he stabs the portrait. And his servants come into his room after hearing a scream and they see the portrait, but now the portrait's of a young, beautiful, innocent man. And then there's this, this, on the ground there's this body, of their master, who's now old and shows the marks of a life lived in debauchery with a knife in his heart. And there were so many times as, as, as I was reading this story that, that Dorian could have sought redemption, but he never did because he would not let the portrait, the mirror of that portrait, speak to him. He took pleasure in the disconnection thinking he could act without consequence, never truly truly realizing it wasn't just a disconnected portrait. It was his soul that he was seeing. 
And rather than show true remorse and seek the forgiveness of God that is offered to us all, he tries to destroy the mirror and instead destroys himself. This is the way of God's truth. God's word is a mirror. Jesus' teaching is a mirror. But if we do not act on it, the consequence isn't to the mirror, it's to us. It's like what Martin Luther King Jr. said, God walks with us. He has placed within the very structure of this universe certain absolute moral laws. We can neither defy them nor break them. If we disobey them, they will break us. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice will be like a wise man. But those who listen and do not act on them will be like a foolish man. The words of Christ act as a mirror because they show us the marring of something innocent, of our true identity. They show us the sin that we have put on something of great value. Because what should it matter if our identity is not in moral goodness? There would be no tragedy if something bad happened to something worth nothing. You cannot mar a thing of no intrinsic value. No, our identity comes from God. We are made in God's image. And when we see that mirror, we cannot help but weep at what we have done to ourselves and to others because of what we have done to the image of God. We can deny the image or walk away from what we've seen, but it doesn't change who we are. We just live in illusion and we will act out of ignorance. A disconnection that the portrait is actually our soul. But if we accept what we've seen, if we see our identity in the image of God on us and on others, how can we not act? We take away that disconnection. We see the beauty that is behind the marred faces. The beauty that is on all of us. That is our soul. And the, that image exists on all people. We realize it isn't a tragedy because of what we've done. It's a tragedy because of what we are. God's own image. When we see what we are in the face of Christ's words, when we see people as made in God's image, we have to act differently. How can we look on a woman or a man in lust, define them by their sexuality, if we see them as made in the image of God? How can we hate our enemies, even if they hate us, if we know they also are made in the image of God? How can we practice self-righteousness if we know it's God's image that gives us value? This knowledge of who we are requires us to act. But not to act in just any random set of morals, to act on any path. All the time I hear, act, act, but there's a certain way we should act. We must act on the narrow way that Jesus taught us. And if we read the Sermon on the Mount, there is only true, truly two commandments that define the entire sermon. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. This is how we are called to act. How Jesus is calling us to act in love. Jesus is calling us to love our neighbors to love each other as God loves us in that sermon. He says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom. Well, they followed the letter of the law. They were obsessive about every single rule, but they did not have the love of God. We don't hate our enemies because we want to be sons and daughters of our Father who also loves them. When we worship God, we show our love for God by not making it a public spectacle, not speaking in many words to seem righteous. We worship Him in honest love. God's love is how Jesus is calling us to act upon His words. But there's a problem, because so often we can take the bite out of something if, if we, by saying love, you know? Oh, well, just love. Well, everybody agrees with that, you know? We make it easy digestible, comfortable, something anybody can get behind. But Christ is talking about a costly love. 
the one that means standing up when it would be much easier sitting down. The one that's willing to say the hard truth, even though it might cost you the feelings of someone you care about. It's not being afraid because you know God is with you. It means loving yourself enough to seek after true righteousness, true goodness, though the world will tell you to give up over and over again. It's throwing off those temptations, putting down what we know is wrong, living as though we had the power to overcome. And we do, brothers and sisters. That costly love is more powerful than the draw of those things that would break us. It's more powerful than sex. It's more powerful than money. It's more powerful than hatred, anger, envy, because it is of God. It is like a current, ever flowing and never breaking. It means loving God enough to lay down your life to Him. Not once, every single day, every chance, putting laying your life down into practice. It can be different things at different times. Sometimes it means picking up. Sometimes it means laying down, giving up, giving in, standing firm, ground down, raised up, strung up, following through, stopping before we start. It's complicated, but it is simple because it flows through a question we should be asking ourselves, are we acting according to the love of God? That is putting Jesus' Christ's words into practice. And it is a life. It is the only life. For apart from, from acting according to the love of God, we are dead, even if our bodies do not know it yet. We are living in illusion. We are a house on sinking sand, not on a firm foundation. But do we ask ourselves this question? Can you look in your life and see when you're not acting according to the love of God. You and I must change that. We are called to greater things. The love of God is inside of us. Will we let it flow? We cannot be those people who God speaks about in Isaiah 29.13 when He says, because this people draw near with their words. They honor Me with their lip service but they remove their hearts far from me. And their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by routine. Our hearts must remain close to God through Christ. For Christ showed us the unblemished image of our Creator. The image willing to be stained not by His deeds, but by our own out of love Godly love. Our hearts must remain close to that love in all that we do. Letting that love shine through us. We must act. We must know ourselves to act. And we must act out of love. A costly love. And I think better than all of that, in the words of a teacher, a school teacher, he came to my desk with a quivering lip. The lesson was done. Dear teacher, I want a new leaf, he said. I spoiled this one. In place of that leaf so stained and blotted, I gave him a new one, all unspotted, and into his sad eyes smiled. Do better now, my child. I went to the throne with a quivering soul. The old year was done. Dear father, hast thou a new leaf? For me, I've spoiled this one. He took the old leaf stained and blotted and gave me a new one all unspotted and into my sad heart smiled. Do better now, my child. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we, we ask You to help us to be a people who act according to Your words. We pray, Lord, that You may give us that strength to step out in those areas of our lives that we, we need to bring our attention to, Lord, that we need to stop making excuses for and just change for You, Lord, out of the love that we have for You. We pray, God, that You might be with us on that journey, that You might show us the right path all of our days. 
We ask this in your son's Jesus Christ's name. Amen.